has chosen to give you the opportunity to be here today. Perhaps it could be a smile to your mom. Perhaps it's listening to your dad. Perhaps it could be a two-rak'ah prayer that you pray in the depths of the night in which you ask Allah for hidayah and guidance. Perhaps you fed a poor person for which the person said, May Allah give you good in this dunya and the akhirah. Perhaps you came on Hajj and Umrah many years ago and you said, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirah hasana wa qina adab al the most oft repeated dua of the Prophet. I don't know what it is, but rejoice in the fact that today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for you. Rejoice in the fact that you would not be here if Allah did not want good for you. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like the person who is going to make a mockery of people by putting them in the haram, in the best of times, in the best of places, in the best of situations, doing the best of ibadah, only to put them into Jahannam. He is doing this in order to put you in Jannah. He is doing this in order to make you from those people who are forgiven in this dunya, so that you win in the akhirah. He is doing this so that you have an opportunity to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Jannah and walk hand in hand with him. My brothers and sisters of Islam, this is the Hajj that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained in the Quran. And wallahi, one of the things that we do unfortunately is we make Hajj into a series of rituals. Right, what do we have to do? Shaykh, okay, we've got to slaughter a sheep, we've got to wear an ihram, do I put perfume on, do I cut my hair? What about my essence? And now we are running around the Kaaba as a demonstration of us being willing to listen to any command Allah has for us, any request He has for us to do. Reflect on every single thing. Why are you in Aziziyah? Why are you in Mina? What does the word Mina come from? What about Arafah? Reflect on Arafah. What does it mean? Yes, you know, the first level of knowledge, you know, there was a very wise man who told me that levels of knowledge are four types. First comes that's basic information. Then comes knowledge. After knowledge comes understanding, then comes wisdom. Yeah? Muzdalifa. So why sleep in Muzdalifa? Why pray in Maghrib and Isha and Muzdalifa not in Arafat? Why? So let me share with you in just a few minutes the secrets of Hajj and the wisdom behind Hajj. Okay? Now, Hajj is a great visit to Allah. Is that correct? So imagine the great king has called out to all his servants and slaves worldwide and said, all oh, servants and slaves, answer my call. I am your creator, I'm your Lord. Come and visit me. I have ordered you to come and visit my house. So we have all prepared. We have left every single thing that is not important to us other than Allah And we have brought only our ihram and ourselves and a few simple things to help us on our journey. And we came back to the same place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us all again. The hadith is not established, but it is there in the books of Tafsir that Allah subhanahu wa created us and brought us all together on a plane similar, if not the same plane of Arafat, and asked us about the mithaq. Which is the mithaq? Alastu bi rabbikum kulna bala. Am I not your Lord when Allah took us out from the, from the backside of Ibn Adam, of, of Adam salam, and from his from his body and he created us and he said, am I not your Lord? And we said, yes, Ya Rabbi. So in the same place we gather, and because Arafat is the beginning, real beginning of Hajj, it's the first pillar, if not after, after, after Ihram itself, the very first pillar right after that is Arafat, al Hajj Arafat as the Prophet said. So let's start our explanation from Arafat. So we all gathered together, just like that day when Allah had created us all, which I'm sure no one remembers, right? If you remember, please let me know. There's uh, medicine that I can give you guys, just in case, inshallah, okay? All right, but no one should remember that. But the athar, the net effect of that mithaq is the fitra that you have in your heart. The ability to recognize Allah and the truth of Islam. So you are in Arafat, and you've now left everything, and you're now in Arafat now, begging Allah Zawajal, this is Dhuhr time, you've just prayed your Dhuhr and Asr together, You've just combined, so you have the whole day now to beg Allah Zawajal. Now, who knows about the Haram of Makkah and Medina? Do you know whether Arafat is inside of, of the Haram of Makkah or outside the Haram of Makkah? Araf, Arafat is outside. Yes, it's actually permissible to, to if you're not uh, in Haram, 
to uh, catch an animal, uh, to hunt an animal, to uh, cage a bird, uh, to, to graze and graze your sheep, if you have sheep. You have some sheep. Yeah, if you have some sheep, and you can graze them in Arafat. Of course, other times you can stick to Hajj uh, affairs now, please. But in Arafat, Arafat is actually outside of the Haram. So imagine you're now outside the kingdom of the, of the great king. You're outside there. These massive walls, these huge fortress around. And you are there and you are a beggar. You are in two pieces of clothing. You are disheveled. You have had a hard time. It's in the noon time. You are in distress and difficulty. And you are now begging Allah, Oh Allah, open your gates of mercy for me. Can you imagine that? That's literally how you should be feeling in Arafat. That you are this beggar outside the gates of the great king, begging Allah to open his gates of mercy. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ, when the reins of the camel fell off from his hand, he only put one hand down in order to go out. So much so that the people even said, in Al Mughni of Ibn Qudama, there is a munaqasha, an argument, whether the Prophet ﷺ, how he made dua. Some said he made dua like this, like this. Some said at one point the Prophet's hands pointed down, meaning the palms pointed down. In fact, Ibn Qudama Rahim explains it wasn't the case. What it was is the Prophet was so fervent. You know, when you're so fervent making dua, you want to reach out so much, so much so that your hands are so high. Oh Allah, please, oh Allah, please. Have you seen a little kid? Have you seen a little kid? You know, when you have a, a few pieces of chocolate and then your kids come around, ba 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 ba, I want some. And then you know, they're all jumping up to grab it, right? Because mercy of Allah is within your, your reach, ya akhi. You are in Arafat. Allah's attention is with you. The whole world, the unseen world is there with you. Do you understand? Do you understand that? Do you understand that Allah is talking about you right now to Jibreel, to Mikail, to the souls of the martyrs? Do you understand that? To your whole aim if you end up going to Jannah, to your servants in Jannah, those who are with them, and those who are Yahmaluna Arsha Rahman, Allah is telling them about you. How amazing is that? So you are grabbing that mercy almost you're about to grab. Oh Allah, oh Allah, open your gates of mercy. And that is why, this is why Sufyan al Tawri rahimahullah, he's the worst person, pathetic human being, the one who thinks Allah's mercy is not big enough. If he can forgive someone who killed 99 people, if he can forgive someone who made shirk with Allah, if he can forgive someone who fought Allah and his messenger. I mean, the battle of Uhud, can you imagine? Who were the three leaders? who fought the Prophet in the battle of Uhud, killed the most number of Sahaba, killed the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Who were they? In the middle was Abu Sufyan. And the right flank was Ikrimah bin Abu Jahl. And the left flank was Khalid bin Walid. Every one of them became Muslimin. Every one of them died in Shahada. Can you imagine? If Allah can forgive that, that's why. That's why. Qal al-Hasan al-Basri. Ma arja ayati fi taqibi kitab Allah. Al-Hasan al-Basri said, do you know which verse in the Quran gives the most hope the most hope so the student said Na ya Hassan, which verse he said the verse where Allah says right about Ashab al -Ukhdud. you know the people in Yemen who that man who that uh, that uh, king who started to you know kill people because they believed in Allah Zawajah. so he built a huge pit of fire and he cut people and he you know, ripped their muscles from their bones and he threw them into the fire, right? And those are the same Ashab al Ukhdud Allah is referring to in this verse, Surah Balik. What does Allah say? Verily, those who have killed the believing men, women, then they don't repent. Yani? So Al Hasan Basri said, if you kill Muslimi, and you rip the babies out of their bellies. You should be tortured in fire in this life before the next. But if Allah is saying you still have an opportunity to make tawbah, how much hope does that give to any other human being on the day of Arafat? Can you imagine? Is there anyone here who's killed people? No. Is there anyone here who's committed those sort of heinous crimes? Arham al Rahimi. No one like him on the day of judgment. No one. Yet the other. If the first of you, the last of you, the jinn of you, the ends of you came to me with an ocean of sins, like the oceans of this dunya, I would forgive you. Wala ubali, he said. Wala ubali means I don't care. I don't care. So this is you begging Allah. And that's why the most important thing is to beg Allah. 
And that's why to do it and to perfect your dua on the day of Arafah is so important. And there is no dua that you can think of, yeah, that is good except Allah will accept on the day of Arafah. <laughs> and so Alhamdulillah, imagine now you begged Allah until sunset. So the great king has accepted now because you've earned his mercy and you have earned his attention. So now he tells the gatekeepers, open the gates. And so the great angels are open the heavenly gates and now you are allowed to go. And that's why you don't pray your Maghrib and your Isha in Arafah. Why would you pray? Man, the gates are open. Are you mad? You would rather go inside, right? Wouldn't you? Think about it. Yeah? You go inside. Don't you agree? That's why you do it. So you go inside Muzdalifa. And Muzdalifa is covered by these mountains which are actually the gates of the Haram. And they are called Mash'ar al-Haram. Why? The signs of the Haram. Right? Is that, is that making sense now? So you go to a place called Muzdalifa. Why? Because Muzdalifa comes from the word Izdalafa. Izdalafa means to come close. Izdalafa minni. That he came close to me. So we have come close to Allah now. And the first thing you do is that you've been standing up making dua to Allah, begging Allah. The whole day, so your hands are tired, your legs are tired, you're disheveled. First thing you gotta do is sleep. I don't know, have you guys had like a 40 hour journey, 42 hour journey? So then we go to Arafah, we go to Muzdalifah, and we sleep there, just like we would be. Totally exhausted when we sleep. That's exactly what the Prophet did. Some of the Salaf like to pray at night, the Hajjud, some said, no. First thing you do is you remember the same king that allowed you in. Yeah? Because you want to thank the host. So this is what Allah says. When you wake up in the morning, Allah عِنْدَ الْمَشْرِ الْحَرَمِ You remember Allah at the gates of the Haram. Thank you, Ya Allah, for letting us in. Ya Rabbi, we can't wait to meet you. Oh Allah, you are the greatest. Oh Allah, you are the most, the most amazing. We're going to meet you right now, inshaAllah. We're going to come visit your house, which is symbolic for meeting Allah. Correct? Now, on that day, we move off just before sunset, before sunrise. Why? Because a mushriki stayed, so stayed after sunrise, we move off before, we want to be different from them. So we move off. What do we do on that day? What did the Prophet ﷺ do? Ran haq, right? He did something called Ran haq. Rami, ha is halq, noon is nahar, and ta is tawaf. Correct or not, guys? He did Ran haq. Rami, ha is halq, noon is nahar, meaning slaughtering, and then ta is tawaf. Correct, guys? That's the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. Ran haq, as the ulama call it. Yes? And destroy it. So the first thing you want to do, just like the shahada is, is la ilaha illallah. No God, true God, worthy of worship, except Allah. Correct? So you want to demonstrate the first part of your tawheed and your kalima is by disagreeing and defeating and overlooking and not believing in any other type of ta'bud other than Allah's love, right? Other than Allah's other than true God. That's why you do your story, which is symbolic for what? Your disbelief in other religions, your disbelief in shaitan, your disbelief in kufr of Allah Right? And that's what you do. You do your stoning. That's what just one jamrah on that day. One main shaitan, as we call it. But obviously not shaitan in there. It's just a symbolic nature of, of, of throwing that away. And when you throw your thing stones, it's as if you're throwing kufr away from you. And you're disbelieving in it. Right? It's a bit like, you know, um, when you hate somebody, you can tell him. There's also something you could, you could spit at him or throw stones at him, couldn't you? But a bit more symbolic, a way of saying, you know what? You're totally away from me. I'm totally rejecting you. And so we're totally leaving shit behind. And that's why your talbiyah finishes at that point. Labbaik Allahumma, labbaik finishes at that point. Why does it finish at that point? It finishes at that point because now you've established your la sharika lak. There is no one that has associated partners be proven it now with your words, with your actions. And so Hajj is all about that. Hajj is all about what you're saying, prove it now. What you're saying, prove it now. Yes? So that's what you do. First thing you do is that you stone. Yes? Ram, Rami. What's that? Yaqi, you know, one of the most amazing things about the deen is that we don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through one type of ibadah only. Yani the Khawarij, they worship Allah only through fear. The Christians, they worship Allah only through love. Right? And the Murjia, they worship Allah only through hope. In Islam, we worship Allah through all of the three together. Just like Ibn Qayyim said, disbelieved in all other gods is illallah. Allah, Rabbana, our Lord. 
is your love for Allah. How do you demonstrate your love for Allah? How do you demonstrate, Ya Rabbi, I hate all kufr and I love only you, Ya Rabbi. How do you demonstrate your love for Allah? So Allah showed it. And Ibrahim saw in his dream, okay? Wa'id qala Ibrahim, David, what did he say to his son? Ya Bunayya, inni arafil manami anni adbahuk. I saw in my dream I'm slaughtering you. So on that day, Ibrahim's wife prepared his son. Can you imagine the poor woman? Prepared him, they said in the, in the tafsir, they said that they prepared him just like the day he was going to get married. SubhanAllah, Ismail. And they prepared him as if he was going to get married. Beautiful clothes, beautiful smile, beautiful boy, light on his face, the poor father takes him and then lies him down, right? And as he's putting the, the knife to his neck, guess what happens? He feels that he is not being sincere to Allah. He feels that perhaps he will slaughter, but perhaps Allah will not accept it because his heart is not fully there, because he can look and see the eyes. The eyes, you see, tell a story. The eyes, the tears. So what did he do? فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا and so when both of them submitted and he turned Ismail on his back, meaning he said, my son, turn over on your back. I'm going to slaughter you from the back. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to have nothing but love for Allah in his heart. Ya khwani, your slaughtering is not a slaughtering man. Your slaughtering is not just like, okay, when's the slaughtering happening? I you hear this from the hujjaj? It's like a chicken you're slaughtering, man. It's like, you know, you tell your wife, like, a chicken done yet? No, it's still being slaughtered. I mean, man, just hit it. I mean, come on, man. This is love for Allah. This is your love for Allah. This is why if you're able to slaughter, slaughter. If you're able to go to the slaughterhouse and slaughter and think about, Ya Rabbi, with this slaughter, I'm sacrificing all other love. Wallahi, Ya Rabbi, if you wanted us to slaughter our children, we would have done it. But from your mercy and kindness, you have not told us to do that. So that there is another progeny that will live that will worship you, Ya Rabbi. So what does Allah Zubin want us to do? Want you to do? Symbolize your love for Allah by slaughtering another another life. Does that make sense, Ikhwan? So your slaughtering is slaughtering every other love other than love of Allah. Are we clear? The slaughter, yeah? And we have proven our love to him through this love. Then comes Halq. Ha which means to shave your head. Why? Because you want to get rid of all pride. And because when a slave comes in front of Allah, he is totally humbled. And these are three things you've got to do, Ya Ikhwan, in your life. Allah is teaching us disbelieving every ta'ud, fearing only Allah. Allah is teaching us to love only Him. Allah is teaching us to humble ourselves in front of Him. And that's why I didn't cut all my hair. Can you guys see that? Some of you are thinking, oh my God, Shaykh is going to keep his hair. Astaghfirullah, yani. This guy's got no taqwa in it. Yeah? Some of you are thinking that, right? No, I know, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking, guys. Because the other good judge came to me and they told me that. No, actually, some of the scholars said that if you have more hair for hajj than you take off for, uh, for shaving, it has more ajr because the greater D is hajj, isn't it? Umrah is a smaller D. Hajj is the greater D. So if you have more hair for hajj, it has more ajr. Allah ta'ala, I follow that understanding. And as a result, I only trim my hair for Umrah and I shave my hair for Hajj. For hajj so, yes, I do have hair, Zakallah khair, but it will not be there very soon. So, ha is called, it's called halq, right guys? Why? Because you want to humble yourself. And then, as soon as you humble yourself, khalas, you prove that you're out of ihram. Because if you are in ihram, you can't do halq. So, it's like people are saying, Shaykh, are we still in ihram? Are you crazy? You should shave your head. You can't. Head. And then, Put his perfume. Don't you go and visit Allah Zawajal in a dirty way. You're going to visit the King of Kings. When Allah does one blesses somebody, He wants to see that on him. You don't go disheveled and in your dirty ihram, smelly, be what, be all. You know what I'm saying? Put some perfume on it. If you've got problems, I'll buy it for you, man. Come see me, man. If you can find me, that is. <laughs> yeah? Okay, put lots of nice perfume, nice top, uh, you know, nice, beautiful. This is a day of Eid. It's a day of visiting Allah Zawajal. So the Prophet prepared himself. Everything is halal except for women, of course, right? Women meaning uh, sexual pleasures or, or kissing your wife with pleasure. None of that's allowed. You can still grab their hands, etc. But 
or leave the mother very young wife and young no desire. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Okay, so if there's any brothers and sisters, I mean, you know, I spend Hajj like this year, you know, we have a new fad at the moment. It's called uh, uh, Mahar, Hajj is Mahar, right, guys? So they just suddenly get married, they come for Hajj and Musiba, yeah. <laughs> Musiba takes place. Yeah. So I, told, I, I usually tell them, listen, you are that part of Arafat, that one, and the other part of Arafat. Yeah. <laughs> You're not allowed to see each other, even touch each other, until you finish your Tawaf and Sarah. Then you can do what you want. We don't need to know. Okay, but until that time, none of this uh, you know, honeymoon business. Leave it to somewhere else, Las Vegas. Okay, so <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So guys, after Hulk shaving, you put your perfume clothes on, you put your ihram on, now you're ready to visit the great king. And for Allah, upon mankind is to visit the house. So we go into Tawaf. And now we do our Tawaf. And we tell Allah, Ya Rabbi, we have come. And it's like visiting Allah. And so we do it in a nice way, Ya Rabbi. We've answered your plea, we've come. And then you do your Sa'i to show your Tawakkul on Allah. What is Sa'i except Tawakkul, right? This is a woman who was left in the middle of a barren land. Ya Hajar radiallahu ta'ala anha and she said to her husband saying Allah amarak has Allah ordered you to do this Ibrahim said yes and so Ali Islam said yes and so Hajar said then Allah will never leave us alone and to prove that further she kept her running between the two Safa and Marwa yeah she put her running between Safa and Marwa and then she after seven circuits Allah gave her the fruits of tawakkul, which is zamzam that is meant to be drunk in the yawm al qiyamah. Can you imagine? There's a hadith that says that when the, when the, before, as you know, before the, the jal comes, when everything has dried up, yeah? The one thing that will never dry up is zamzam. The people of the world will drink from zamzam. How many millions do we drink, mashallah? Still, it continues to flow, mashallah, yeah? Zamzam, ya khwani. Zamzam, mashallah. The fruits of tawakkul. So what, what have you learned? You've learned to have disbelieve in all Allah's enemies and that is fear of Allah from Shirmi. Number two, you've learned to have love of Allah. You've learned to humble yourself in front of Allah and you've learned to have tawakkul on Allah. Isn't that right guys? Think about these. These are the essential matters of your ibad. These are the ways to cleanse your heart and come to Allah. إِلَّا مَنْ أَطَّ اللَّهِ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ That heart that is pure is the one that has tawakkul, the one that has love, the one that has fear of Allah. The one that is hope and that's why after you finish all of this you come back to Mina for how many days three days why Mina why Mina why can't we go as is here you know why is it just next door then? why can't we and you know I was like trying very hard you know with my sheikh the other day said sheikh you know uh, they have a really nice uh, building over here you know, just just exactly outside the gates of Mina can I please stay there no I said why a sheikh because why can't we stay here? Why do we have to stay inside Mina? Why? Because Mina comes from the word Muna. What does Muna mean in Arabic? It means hope. It means that you have now done what Allah has asked you to do and you are hoping for Allah's mercy. And that is the lesson of our life. You do your ibadah, you do your hajj, you do your, uh, your, your slaughtering, your sacrifice and your charity and you lead your whole life with hope from Allah. Oh Allah accept it from us. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka'atas samira Yeah, does that make sense? It's called hope. That's why you stay over there and you keep praising Allah So Allah teaches us how to hope. is to stay in a place, to make dhikr of Allah, praise Allah a lot, and then to have hope from Allah because you are in Mina, which is Muna. Finally, you're going to end Hajj, right? How are you going to end Hajj? When you're ready to leave the kingdom, what's the last thing you do? Who do you meet last? You know when you are saying goodbye to everyone in the family? At the airport, you know, Chachi, Dadi, Nani, everyone's there. You know, who do you hug the last? Who do you kiss the last? It's usually the one that you love the most. If you have four wives, don't even try. That's mushkila. <laughs> That's mushkila, guys. Yeah. Don't even try. Do that in the car. Yeah? But watch out. Even for kids, like, you know, even my kids are so sensitive to the one that I kiss and, and hug last. Musiba, yeah. Yeah? Because they pay attention. People pay attention to these things, you know? So who do you meet the last? It's Allah That's why you do your Buddha Tawaf. You say goodbye to Rabbana. And that's why you leave straight away. You don't spend any other time. You don't go and sleep again. You don't go and shop again. You don't go and do anything else unless you 
need to buy a few things, drinks and whatever else, then would you leave? And that's why it's called the last du'a. Does that make sense now? Is Hajj making sense? Is it, is it giving a renewed spirit to do this Hajj? Wallahi, every time I think about Hajj, Wallahi, I don't care. Qatar has a problem with Saudi Arabia and so they don't allow me in, I don't care. I will go to the UAE and come into Saudi Arabia. You know, canals dug all the way. Some said from River Euphrates in, in Iraq. She had canals dug all the way, can you imagine? From there to supply water to the people of Arafat. So the people of Arafat thereafter, every Hajj would be so happy because they would now have fresh drinking beautiful water from the river Euphrates all the way from Iraq to there. So when she died, everyone, everyone said, mashallah, you know like, when you die, you think, oh, mashallah, King Salman built this big thing, mashallah, is going to get this, or mashallah, Adil, mashallah, you've got a thousand people for Hajj, that's going to be his ticket to Jannah, or Abu Yusuf did this, or, uh, you know, Asif did that. You know what I'm trying to say? You think the big deeds want to get them to Jannah? So one of the people saw Zubaydah in her in the, in the dream and said, Ya Zubaydah, what is Allah done with you? He said, Allah forgave you. He said, for what? Is it for that canal? He said, no. He said, for two rakahs that I prayed in the middle of the night. For two rakas I pray for the middle of the night. Yeah? So don't belittle really the small things. The thinker of Allah. When you're lying in your bed and you're crying to Allah, no one knows except Allah. The little good deed that you do in Mina, when you go out in the depths of the night, finding your coolness and giving a banana, or there looking up, say, Allah, oh, you are the Kareem. I have nothing else but this banana to give. Give me change. You know what I'm saying? That's when you know that Allah is al kareem That's when you know that Allah is the greatest of the great. Make sense, Ikhwan? Don't belittle the small things. <coughs> Do the big things, but don't belittle the small things. Okay? And have a great hajj.